Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 16th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from David Stewart today. <coughs> Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind <coughs> everyone present to switch off mobile phones and all electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item three in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the prohibited procedures on protected animals, Exemption Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft. Uh, we have two panels today. I welcome the first panel, which is Dr. Tim Parkin, a panel of one. Uh, members will have a series of questions for you, Dr. Parkin, um, but it, we may have other issues that come out in the course of the discussions, and we may indeed write to you following up on this to seek further clarification. Um, so I'll kick off. Uh, just to set the scene, Dr. Parkin, can you briefly summarise the methods that were used to carry out the studies that we're looking at? Um, and identify whether there are any limitations or bias in the studies. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the, there are two very different studies that we carried out. Um, and at the offset, I think it's very important to understand that in both of those studies, there are very different uh, case definitions or definitions of injury, tail injury, um, and equally very different denominators or populations at risk. One is the survey that we conducted with shooting um, people and asking them about injuries to their dogs in work during the 2010-2011 shooting season and the population at risk in that particular study is true working dogs, so dogs in work. The second study was a, uh, an examination of veterinary records from 16 practices throughout Scotland and the denominator or the population at risk in that is working breeds. So it's quite important to make that definition. So in the second study, we're not talking about dogs that are necessarily in work. So in the first study, we conducted an online questionnaire that was distributed by uh, relevant organisations uh, by email or publicised on websites, uh, asking individuals of the shooting fraternity to complete a questionnaire about injuries uh, in their dogs in the 2010-2011 season. <coughs> The, the results of that, or the, the methodology is a well-used methodology. It does have, it flaw, have its flaws in terms of being an online survey, in terms of being able to identify a response rate, because you really don't know how many individuals you actually hit, how many people uh, actually saw the questionnaire and then didn't respond or did respond. Um, but that's a well-known issue with respect to online surveys. There are clearly um, potential biases in that study, because of the population that we are questionnaireing, and it's been an emotive issue over the last 10, 15 years. Um, but it is the only population that we could ask about injuries to those working dogs, essentially. Would there not also be a bias potentially in the second study? Because if you're consulting vets' practices, you're excluding any injuries or information on any injuries that perhaps gamekeepers or other users of working dogs would have deemed it appropriate to address themselves and not take to veterinary surgeon. That's exactly right. But that's exactly why it's important to understand that the two different studies have different definitions of injury. The one is, I would refer to owner-reported tail injury mm -hmm. with no validation, no verification of the mm -hmm. severity of that injury. The second is tail injuries that required veterinary treatment or the owner deemed to require yeah. veterinary treatment. So it is quite important to make that difference. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Morning. Um, I noticed in the uh, British Association for Shooting Conservation's um, submission to committee, they said they were involved in helping to frame the studies. Can you just explain in what way did they so we had into a the... So, of those studies. Yeah, so we had a steering group that uh, advised us uh, when we uh, acquired the funding from the Scottish Government, we were um, provided with a steering group from interested members, had BVA, uh, uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, uh, BASC were on it, SGA were on it. So we had a, a representative from all the interested parties on that steering committee that we met with every three months during the one year of the study. The primary input uh, into the study design from all of those individual groups was uh, in terms of the design of the questionnaire and ensuring that we asked appropriate questions in that questionnaire. So quite a lot of work went on at the beginning to ensure, because you only get one shot at this, to ensure that the appropriate level of detail was acquired during that questionnaire. 
Okay. Um, and just in terms of the, um, the data that came out of the study, um, did it show that there are injuries to uh, dogs' tails that, that were docked as well as those which were uh, undocked? Yep, there, there were injuries to, um, I'd have to look up the figures, but there were injuries to uh, docked tails, undocked tails, um, and everything in between. Right, okay. I, th I think the important thing from that owner survey study was that it suggested that certainly for spaniels and hunt point retrievers, if they were docked uh, by a third or more, they were 20 times less likely to end up with an injury compared to an undocked tail. Given the, the limitations that we've already discussed in the two um, studies, how confident are you that these form a sound basis for policy making? I, we made a statement at the end of the first paper, I think, that I still stand by, that I think says something along the lines, I believe this forms the best available evidence we have. And I think that's probably true. Now, it is a it is an issue with observational epidemiology, the type of work we do, that there are always going to be biases in these data and these studies. So we can never be 100% sure. Uncertainty is the one issue that we always deal with that we find very difficult to get across to policymakers, stakeholders, to understand that we are never going to be 100% certain in, in what we're saying. Has there any work been done comparing the level of um, damage to working dogs' tails in the uh, parts of the UK where there is an exemption, do we have figures about you know what the vets are seeing when a tail has been shortened? You know the level of injury that still occurs set against what's happening in Scotland. I don't. I don't believe we do. Apart from potentially the, the diesel study that was fund, partially funded by the Scottish government, I'd have to look into the details of that. I don't. I don't. I think the the issue with the diesel study is that it wasn't purely working dogs, it was pet dogs, and only 9% of the dogs reported in that study were working dogs. So right, okay. my view is that the two studies we have here are much more applicable to deciding on legislation going forward in terms of working dogs, okay. specifically hunt point retrievers and spaniels. Okay. Mark Russell, do you have any more questions in this area? Yes, I'll just come back to, a, to another area, convener. Um, I've had a quote here from Professor Donald Broom from the Royal College of Veterinary. Science. And he says that removing a significant part of a dog's tail is like preventing a significant part of human speech. Um, we've also got a quote from one of his colleagues, Sarah Heath, uh, who's a European veterinary specialist in behavioural medicine, who said that in interactions between dogs, the subtle signals of tail position will help to create an accurate impression of emotional state and therefore expected behavioural responses. This can be vital in predicting potential outcome of encounters between dogs reducing the risk of confrontational interactions. Um, would you say that the work of vets across Scotland involves a significant number of treatments of dogs that have been involved in confrontational interactions? I have no, no figures to base any answers to that on. I, I wouldn't know to what degree individuals, uh, vets in, in practices, deal with confrontation between dogs. I would it's, say... It's just dogs attacking other dogs. <coughs> dogs attacking dogs yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would say that probably the breeds that are involved in that sort of confrontation are not the breeds we're talking about today. Would you say, though, that the uh, removal of a tail, uh, would you agree with other colleagues in the veterinary profession in the RCVS that removal of a tail does actually inhibit uh, communication and can lead to these, um, in the words of uh, the Professor, confrontational interactions? Uh, Potentially, but I would remind you that we were talking about the removal of up to a third of the tail, not removal of the whole tail here. So yeah. the degree to which you might modify communication is probably okay. is probably questionable in terms of removal of one third of the tail. I don't know. I just don't think we have the evidence, strong evidence, to say yes or no whether that would alter communication between individual dogs. So in terms of the evidence that you're presenting in front of this committee and the studies that you've done, you haven't looked at any potential negative impacts of tail shortening on the behaviour and communication of dogs. And, and following from that, the likelihood then of those dogs needing to seek veterinary treatment? No, no. That wasn't part of the study. No. Yeah. Did you also cover any aspect of uh, 
physiological pain or problems post docking? No. Um, no. You know, nebulas no. caused by um, <clears throat> no again tealing of nervous system. No, again, this was a one-year funded master's study that we had quite a tight timeline on, and part of uh, and there was a very specific remit laid down by the Scottish government in terms of what they wanted addressing, and that was largely epidemiological study to identify whether there had been an increase in risk of tail injury post the uh, legislation introduced in 20, 2007. So no, the, the issues around pain and that sort of thing were not things that we investigated. So in terms of the validity of the study from a veterinary point of view, uh, as providing an accurate assessment of both the risks and the benefits of tail docking, um, would you agree that it perhaps doesn't incorporate all these other, other aspects? It doesn't inc incorporate those other aspects. I think the, the only, what we, we're quite clear that what we're stating is that um, there is clearly an increased risk of tail injury for those undocked, especially hump point retrievers and, and spaniels. And we've made estimates of the number of dogs, puppies you would need to dock in order to prevent one of those outcomes, whatever that outcome might be, with the different definitions. And, and that's as far as the papers go. Mm -hmm. So if there was, say, a, a dog which had a behavioural problem as a result of its uh, tail being docked, and that was, say, one dog in every hundred, uh, would that be uh, the basis for concern of perhaps balancing out the, the benefits of this policy <coughs> versus the, the concerns? Or? Well, it, I mean, that one dog in every hundred is, is a number presumably plucked out of the air, or is it, does it have any basis? It, I mean, it, well, if it's I'm one out of a hundred, or if it's one out of 10,000, or one out of a million, yeah, then that's yeah. a very different assessment, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just pointing out that there doesn't appear to be an assessment uh, of what these implications might be from tail docking in terms of behavioural and communication issues. So um, it's uh, very, very difficult no, to No, I can't remember in the discussion whether we mentioned whether we put a line in there about uh, impact on communication or, right. um, or not, whether we put that in the discussion. Certainly it wasn't any of our work to examine okay. the influence of or the impact of uh, tail shortening on communication. No, okay. That wasn't part of the study. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Well, thank you, Karina. Good morning, uh, Dr. Park. Uh, could I ask you if there's any evidence or information you could point us in the direction of in terms of the numbers of um, working dogs in Scotland? <laughs> Very difficult. And I, and I noticed from some of the papers um, an assessment, uh, I can't remember which, which section it was on, but actually trying to get an idea of the number of licensed breeders. And to be a licensed breeder, I think you need to have at least five, li five litters a, a year or something like that. So mm -hmm. I think the vast majority of breeders in Scotland probably aren't licensed. So I think, I think that information is, is lacking. And it, I think it's one of the recommendations we made in one of the papers to actually follow up and actually try and identify how many breeders are impacted by the current legislation and how many spaniels and hump point breeders um, hump point retriever breeders there are in Scotland, but I, I, I just don't have those figures. I just don't know. Right. So would that be something that, um, in your own view, would be um, difficult to collect, that sort of information? On what basis would you... Do you have any suggestion of how that might be best collected to well, inform I mean, the, the <coughs> discussion? I mean, presumably, the the people who, who'd have most information with respect to that would be the SGA and the and Basque um, individuals. Um, uh, plus those licensed breeders, but um, I, th 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 those individuals, I'm sure, will be able to answer those questions much better than, than me. Thank you. We'll pursue that later yeah. in this morning's session. Claudia Beamish, do you want to continue with? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to take on this, the next set of questions? <coughs> Six and seven. Six and seven. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the guidance. <laughs> um, so, uh, just following on. Um, do you think that the proposed regulation will mean that full litters of puppies of the relevant breeds will be docked since breeders and vets uh, will not know um, which ones will go on to be working dogs? I think that's probably undoubtedly the case. I think, you know, um, I think w what's really important here is that if there is any intervention uh, introduced, it is, it is as targeted as possible, such that if we had a crystal ball and we could definitively say that this dog is going to get a tail injury, as a working dog at five days of old age, and we would say, would you therefore dock it and, or shorten it? And you say, yes. We don't, we're not in that situation. So the key is to make sure that as few dogs or puppies are docked as puppies um, that are not going to go into work. But it is undoubtedly the case that um, uh, it's very likely, you can't tell the difference between uh, five day old puppies, which of those are most likely to go into work. So it will be the majority of the litter, uh, or all the litter. 
Um, and if all of them go into work, then that's, that's good. But if only one of them goes into work or none of them go into work, then clearly that's an intervention that um, potentially is not warranted. <coughs> Right, thank you. And uh, just to take it a step further, could this mean that most puppies of the breeds um, in question will be docked? Again, it depends on how <clears throat> you come to that definition of, of which breeds or which breeders um, and, and the evidence put forward to the vet to de determine that, that those puppies are most likely to go into work. So whether it's mm -hmm. those breeders have a history of breeding dogs for work, whether they have shotgun licenses, et cetera, um, that sort of thing. Those sort of bits of evidence, I think, are key. And actually, those things have been put in place in England and Wales um, to different mm -hmm. degrees. And I think that's one of the key considerations that should be put in place for this particular legislation, if it goes forward, in terms of actually ensuring that the intervention is targeted as possible. I think we have a real opportunity here to ensure, to make legislation that is significantly better than that that is in, uh, in place down south. It's, it's too broad too broad spectrum uh, in England, particularly, and in Wales, because they've got include terriers. So I think you have the opportunity here to in ensure that it's as efficacious as possible for the particular breeds that are um, affected. Thank you. OK, can, can I just tease that out? It's perhaps an unfair question directed at yourself, but we're, we're getting into this area. If it would appear reasonable from the evidence we've heard that a significant number of veterinary surgeons may decline to carry out a tail shortening procedure, if that happens, doesn't that fatally undermine the role that vets have in, under this instrument, where they are determining from their knowledge of the person who's presenting dogs for sh tail shortening that those dogs are likely to have a working life? So, in terms of... Uh, so, give me that question again. Sorry, sorry, I'm not explaining that particularly well. If essentially, let's say, 50% of vets opt out mm -hmm. of carrying, carrying out this procedure, yeah. does that not undermine the sort of central tenant of this, which is that the vets will make the determination about whether a dog, from their knowledge of the breeder, is likely to be used as a working dog? Because if so many vets opt out of it, how can we be assured that the vets who are making the determination actually know the breeders and their background? My anticipation would be that the vets that would carry out the procedure would be those that are motivated enough and see sufficient tail injuries in working dogs to, to understand that it is potentially a good thing to do. Those vets are those vets that are likely to be in the areas of the country where there are shooting fraternity, where there are the breeders. So I, I would hate to say that a lot of this determination may be based on the fact that they know these people for 20, 30 years and they know that they're friends down the pub or something like that. But that'll be part of the issue in terms of actually understanding who the individuals are. I think it's going to be unlikely that we're going to get to the situation where you've got individual breeders going and seeking out an individual vet who is likely to uh, be in favour of, of tail shortening in a different part of the country just in order to get their, their puppies uh, tail dogged. Mm. OK. Finley Carson. Good morning, Dr. Parker. Uh, now, this may be a difficult question for you to answer right here and now, but I think it's quite important that we get uh, uh, an idea of how many numbers are actually going to be involved to get the, the proper perspective. Are you able to estimate how many dogs uh, might be covered by the exemption and, and of those which might end up being docked? I think uh, your first statement was correct. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing for me to answer. I just don't have that information. I think other members of the second panel will probably be better placed to answer that, I would have thought. I just don't have that information, sorry. Okay. Uh, Alexander Bonnet. Thank you, convener. Can I note my register of interest around countryside management? Um, so Park, um, I think we're all agreed the objective here is just to reduce tail injuries in working dogs later in life. Um, are you able to offer any alternative actions uh, which owners might uh, take to achieve this? I'm not a shooting, hunting, fishing person. Um, we did put in the uh, discussion on the um, the first paper, I believe, um, recommendations that wherever possible, individuals, when they are out hunting uh, um, or shooting, um, uh, do so in, in areas which are less likely to result in tail injury, you know, not in heavy cover and, and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, that, that we recognise <coughs> that that's a, a very difficult thing to recommend and a difficult thing to do when... Um, there are particular areas of the country where shooting is obviously more likely to occur and, and, and does happen. So um, other than that, I think it's very difficult to think of any other 
um, interventions potentially that, that I know of anyway that, that are likely to uh, have an impact. Thank you. Okay. Can I just pick up on that? Um, the BVA in their submissions state, and I quote, chronic pain can arise from poorly performed docking. Can we read from that that their members may lack the necessary skills? Because I think I read somewhere that there are no vets in Scotland under the age of 29 who would have carried out this procedure other than when a dog's a lot older? Or are they suggesting that there is docking going on illegally at the moment? Um, what, what I think, well, you, you, given the uh, cutoff of 29, that's probably um, suggesting that anyone who has done it under the tw age of 29 and has practiced solely in Scotland would have been doing it illegally. Uh, so that, that would be the basis of that, I presume. Um, I don't know whether there's docking going on illegally. I think the anecdotal, I've not heard any anecdotal evidence to suggest that mm -hmm. there is. Um, I, I would suggest that um, it would probably be pertinent if, uh, given we haven't had tail docking in this country since 2007, it would probably be pertinent for anyone um, willing, any vet willing to tail shorten to actually... Uh, undergo CPD training to ensure that they were doing it correctly because it may well be something well it'll likely to be something they weren't exposed to as a undergraduate vet and wouldn't have been trained in sorry Peter Chapman can I come in there I, to me it's a very simple procedure how could you do it wrong I, I, <laughs> I, I, okay I'm a vet I'm an epidemiologist I've spent two weeks in clinic I could probably do it wrong there are, there are, there are plenty of ways you could make a, mass, a mess of uh, tail docking I'm sure the, the whole point is we're, we're, we're suggesting that you remove up to a, or the, leg, the papers are suggesting removal of up to a third of the, of the tail is appropriate so you could end up with people removing much more than a third mm -hmm. um, um, and, and that, that would be one way where uh, you could end up with an incorrect tail shortening taking place but would that would that necessarily be be something that would increase the pain of the of the pop if you took if you took more than a third off? The, 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 I'm, you know, I'm coming from this as a as a farmer. I've never tail docked a, a dog, mm -hmm. but in my previous experience, I've tail docked thousands of pigs, thousands yeah. of pigs, yeah. and and I did it myself. And, and you know, and, and we tail docked pigs right down to yeah, you sure. know just yeah. that stump left. So it's not a third; it's it's mm -hmm. three quarters that comes off. And you know it's a, it's a quick snap and it, the job's done. And I don't see I don't know how I could have done that wrongly because it you know it's 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 over in a flash. I, I would tend to agree. I, I think it would be it would be difficult in a puppy less than five days old to do it wrong. But I'm sure that there would be the occasion where someone inexperienced, perhaps very nervous about doing it for the first time or the, for the first few times, actually did something incorrect. I don't I don't know. Mm. Okay, Mark Roscoe. Brief supplementary about the, you know, some of the origins of tail damage. Um, I think the study that you referenced earlier on by Diesel um, suggested that kenneling, incorrect kenneling, was a was a greater issue than actual, you know, working dogs going through cover and getting snagged or whatever. Is that something that you looked at? And have you got conclusions on kenneling? We we asked in the questionnaire. We asked about. Uh, the respondents to talk about their worst tail injury that the individual dogs had, had suffered. And indeed, I think it's about 8% of those worst tail, tail injuries occurred in kennels. The vast majority occurred during work under in cover or uh, in training. The diesel study, it's probably unsurprising that the majority of tail injuries occurred in uh, kenneling because vast 90, more than 90% of the dogs in that study were pet dogs and not working dogs. So they wouldn't have been exposed to the risk of work. So that's the big difference between the two studies. What about the Cameron study, though? The Cameron study? Yeah. There was no details in that study about how the individual dogs received uh, their tail injury. Right. So the, we, it, we, we simply had a large database of clinical records, and we were able to identify the breed of the dog, the age of the dog or date of birth, and whether they had a tail injury or not. So there were no in, in those clinical records. It was quite it may or may not be the case that certain vets might add details of how the tail injury occurred or <coughs> greater details. But the vast majority simply didn't. They said tail injury, tail fracture, tail laceration, etc., and that's it. Right. So it didn't investigate the cause of that. No. Right. Okay. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Dr. Parkin. Um, 
I'm interested in finding out more about the pain management aspects of it. Um, one of the main reasons for allowing tail docking is that the pain of a tail docking for a puppy is much less than the pain caused by possible injury later in life. So one of the arguments against is that tail docking or shortening causes distress and pain to the puppy. So and as an evidence-based person, you know, my previous experience was assessing pain in non-verbal children or non-verbal adults. What can the science tell us about the pain and distress um, associated with the tail docking for a puppy compared to the pain and distress for a, an adult dog? I think it's very, very difficult. I, I, I don't. I, there's a couple of papers that, or Noonan's paper, that talks about uh, uh, chain, behavioural changes at the time of tail docking in puppies, uh, where they examined uh, where they went from whimpering when they were picked up to, as they called, screeching. Other thing, when actually the tail was removed, and then uh, it concluded that within 15 minutes they were back to essentially normal. But even that doesn't convince me in a, a great deal that actually that truly measures or reflects the degree of pain that the puppies were exposed to simply their what we're simply measuring is their behavioral response that it may well correlate with pain level but actually we have no real evidence as far as i'm aware to suggest that that's the case i mean maybe, maybe you do in terms of comparing that to uh what adult dogs experience um when the tails are being amputated for example um Again, I, I think it's very difficult to weigh up the differential pain that those two uh, situations uh, present for the individual animal. I, I don't have evidence either way. Okay, I'm aware there are pain assessment tools used for for dogs or other animals. Um, I'm interested. Is there room for maybe studying um, perianalgesic aspects of the procedure, where you would do like a pre-med type <coughs> analgesic, so that you would maybe limit or reduce the amount of pain? So oral um, or whatever. Uh, in puppies, you're mm -hmm. talking about? So in puppies, I think the, the issue is that it's uh, all those drugs are off license. So actually their, their livers, as far as I'm aware, are, are not sufficiently developed to, in order to enable use of pre-med analgesia in puppies. So that's one of the reasons that um, they're not used when uh, tail docking. So I think that the, and I, I've read that essentially the risk associated with those pre-meds would be greater than the risk associated with the docking of the tail. So. I think it'd be quite difficult to develop those studies and get those get licenses to conduct those studies. You'd be looking at um, probably uh, getting home office license in order to conduct those individual studies to identify whether there's significantly reduced pain in puppies with or without pre-med analgesia. Probably be due to the risk associated with the pre-meds in a five-day-old puppy. Okay. Thanks. Kate Forbes. Thanks very much. Um, you've already mentioned that um, your studies wasn't actually analysing um, the argument around pain now versus pain later. Um, but you, there is, there is um, one point of judgment, um, and that is, and I quote, these results suggest a clear potential benefit to be gained from docking at least by one third in spaniels and HPRs. What, um, what, what, what is that main, that main potential benefit then? That, for me, that's simply looking at the figures, suggesting that those dogs that were docked by a third or more were 20 times, in HPRs and Spaniels, 20 times less likely to end up with a tail injury in work in that one season. I think something we haven't touched upon is the fact that we were asking about one season's exposure. Now, many dogs might uh, work for four or five years, so clearly there's going to be a cumulative effect of that protect, potentially protective effect of docking as a puppy over multiple seasons. So we have a, that is only a 20-fold reduction in risk in one season. You could extrapolate that up to multiple seasons for an individual animal. So that's the basis of that statement, simply looking at the figures in terms of the reduction in risk of owner-reported tail injury uh, with or without a tail that is one-third docked or more. Right, thank you. Mark Ruskell. Just following on from that, convener, um, I mean, I think you've quoted the stats that to prevent a tail injury, you'd need to shorten the tails of between 18 and 108 puppies. Um, what about the numbers that would be required to prevent a tail amputation in later life? Because clearly a dog could you know, be presented to a vet because it had a minor injury. You know, some treatment could be applied. That would be it. But an injury that's so severe that a tail would have to be amputated, I think, is the key concern that you're, you're focusing on in your evidence. 
So what are the, the numbers on that? Well, in terms of in terms of one tail amputation, then the figures for spaniels and hunt point retrievers suggest that you need to dock between 320 and 415 uh, puppies to prevent one tail amputation. Right. I so mean, I, I, I'm not. This is this is one of the reasons that we did the two studies because we're looking at different levels of uh, or different definitions of injury. In or different severity of injury in the two studies. The one is the only reported injury, tail injuries. Clearly, they're more common, so you're going to be able. You you don't have to dock as many puppies to prevent one of those as you do a tail amputation. Um, in terms of a tail injury that required veterinary examination, then the figures are between 81 and 135 right. tails that puppies that need to be docked to prevent one of those. So if I've got this right we'd need to dock potentially, we'd need to amputate the tails of 415 puppies to prevent an adult dog from getting a tail amputation. Is that In is order that right? to prevent a single tail amputation, then the expectation, given the prevalence of tail amputation, which is quite low, then you'd be looking at docking 415 puppies' tails to prevent a single amputation. So it, it, it all comes down to where you decide... An adult tail injury is severe enough to warrant hmm. the intervention as a puppy. So in animal welfare terms, um, does that single prevention of a tail amputation in later life outweigh 415 amputations of a puppy less than five days old? It, it, in terms of a tail, tail shortening as a puppy, um, my view would be no. But we're not just talking about tail amputations, are we? We're talking about everything from tail amputation to minor nicks and scratches that a owner reports in the field. So we're talking about everything in between. So we're not, this is not just about tail amputation. It's about tail injuries about minor nicks. that can be recurrent, that can, be, that can become infected, that can be of any scope of injury from, as I said, a, a minor tail nick to a, a full-blown amputation. OK. OK, that's uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, um, Cameron was quoted earlier. Basically, they said the overall prevalence of any tail injury amongst dogs of all breeds taken to a vet in Scotland between 2002 and 2012 was 0.59%. So, and the prevalence of a single tail injury examined by a vet in working dogs breeds between 2002 and 2012 was 0.59%. Nine zero percent. So why would we want to shorten the tails of many puppies for something that's not happening very often? So the, the figures you're quoting are from the um, veterinary um, clinical data. It's probably very likely, although we don't know this, it's likely that the vast majority of those dogs, although they were working breed, were not actually working. So the whole point here is that actually we target the intervention at working breed dogs that are actually likely to work. The whole point about the, uh, veterinary, investiga the veterinary clinical data investigation is that there was no indication at all as to the level of work that individual dogs were doing. So that's the key. We're talking about working breeds rather than working dogs in that particular study. I think the last question I want to ask you is, and sorry if it sounds very simple, uh, dogs... Um, that are going through hedges, etc., whatever, they most often hurt their, their ears. So why shouldn't we cut off their ears? Um, I think that's a, a question that's been put to me on multiple occasions, and, and I think uh, I'm not convinced that they do most often hurt their ears. I think the evidence suggests that actually tails are the particular appendage that uh, ends up being injured more often. I don't have evidence to say that uh, ears are more often hurt than uh, tails. And indeed, it's potentially the case that the, the waggy nature of the tail ends up in a more severe type of, type of injury than you do when you um, have an ear injury. I don't have the evidence to suggest that okay, ears are more frequently injured than tails. Sorry, I, 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 I do apologise. I do have another short question. Short yeah. question. So pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> third of a question. Why would we want to inflict pain on many puppies for something that's not happening routinely every day? Well, the, the, I think this is, the, the, it comes back to the tenet of what I'm saying. I think the key here, if, it's, if legislation is going to be introduced, it needs to be as targeted as possible, such that it is only an intervention 
for individual animals that are most likely to end up with tail injury as an adult. Hence, HPRs and spaniels only from breeders who regularly supply puppies for, for work, um, own a goddamn uh, shot, shotgun license or whatever it may be, some way of ensuring that that intervention is as targeted as possible so that you, get, you avoid the situation you're talking about. Thank you. Any concern about um, dogs of these breeds with with long tails, um, which are non-working dogs, and the injuries that they might sustain as well? Because it would seem that um, through sitting in a kennel or whatever the the way in which they might um, receive that injury, um, that that is also an issue. And I want, and I'm just wondering if you have any comment on that. Yeah. I mean, uh, clearly, if 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 we're talking about working dogs that are sitting in a kennel, then the intervention is going to prevent that tail injury, yes. whether it be in kennel or whether it be in work. Um, from the first paper, I think we suggested that eight percent of the uh, worst tail injuries were uh, in, incurred in kennels. Um, so, it's it's a lesser of an issue, or it's a lesser of a risk factor being in a kennel than it is going out to work. So that that's that's the key. Um, but clearly applying that intervention to a working dog that's in a kennel and it's probably the most it i don't know this is probably this is anecdotal it's my it's my guess that actually working dogs are more likely to be kept in kennels that are more likely to result in an injury than pet dogs that are more likely to be kept on someone's bed or you know in a, in a house etc so they're the sure. ones most likely to be exposed to that kennel risk yeah. as well as the work risk but surely there'd be ways in which um working dogs who are kept in kennels could um have the sort of bedding that um, would enable them to, avo uh, to uh, avoid uh, that uh, injury. Absolutely. I'm sure there are... Uh, I, I have zero knowledge re kennel design, but I'm sure there are optimal kennel designs that would prevent um, uh, tail injury. Yeah, I'm sure there would be, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Emma Harper. Just a quick supplementary. Um, Alexander Burnett asked about alternatives. Is alternatives of Vaseline or trimming the hair or tail wrapping or tail tip points. In America, they use that for their gun dogs, like actual tip covers. Again, I, I have no, no evidence either way whether any of those methods are efficacious or not, and um, uh, other members of the second panel might be able to point to evidence of, of that nature. But I, for me, I, I, I just don't have anything to add to that. Sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. My colleague, Angus McDonald has a question coming up in a second, but before we get to that... You touched earlier on the opportunity that we have here in Scotland to produce better legislation than exists elsewhere in these islands. Could you expand on that in terms of what's wrong with the exemptions that exist elsewhere in your view? In my view, the exemptions elsewhere are too broad uh, in their um, scope, in terms of the, specifically in terms of the breeds affected. We, we were very... The, the initial remit of the Scottish Government um, research that we funded to do looked at specifically Spaniels, Hunt Point Retrievers and Terriers. So we want, those are the three focus breeds that we were asked to look at in terms of the risk associated with uh, tail injury uh, and whether they've been docked or not. And we definitively came up to the conclusion that Terriers were not at greater risk. In Wales, Terriers are uh, currently allowed to be uh, tail shortened. In England, then there's a whole raft of individual working types of dogs that are uh, allowed to be tail shortened and we found no evidence to suggest that terriers are any greater risk we there, there were particular issues around why that might be the case we may have been asking the wrong type of people and we may have been asking out of the wrong type of season in terms of pest control but certainly from the evidence we have we had no evidence that terriers so that's why we're specifically saying if legislation is produced it should be as, as targeted as possible simply for hunt point retrievers and spaniels that's what our evidence suggests okay thank you angus mcdonald Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, we, we know from the proposed uh, regulations that to permit docking, the dog must be five days old or, or less. Um, the dog is a spaniel or a hunt point a retriever breed. Uh, the procedures carried out by a vet, etc., etc. Um, are there any aspects of the regulations that you have con concerns about? Um, I don't think so. I think the the. the Again, it comes back to the same issue. The key is to ensure that whatever aspect, whatever is put in place to ensure that we are docking as few puppies as possible that aren't going to go into work is the key issue. And, and anything that can be introduced to tighten that as much as possible will only benefit, will be, of only, will be the benefit for this particular legislation. I don't have any particular concerns for either legislation as it's written, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, um... 
Thank you for your evidence, uh, Dr Parkin. Um, you will be joining us on the second panel to provide any input to any of the issues that arise. But in the meantime, can I thank you for that evidence? Um, could I also invite you that if anything comes to mind by way of evidence that's out there that would inform our deliberations, if you could get that to the committee before next week's hearing, because this is a very emotive issue on both mm. sides, and, and the evidence base, the greater the evidence base we have, the better for the members. Mm. So thank yeah. you for that. I'm going to suspend briefly uh, while we get the second panel lined up.
Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We continue our discussions with stakeholders on the Prohibited Procedures on Protected Animals Exemption Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft. And we have been joined by Melissa Donald, who's the Scottish Branch President of the BVA, Jim Dukes of Dukes Vet Practice, who is here um, on behalf of the Scottish Gamekeepers Association to offer his expertise. Runa Hannigan, uh, Deputy Veterinary Director of the Dogs Trust, and Alan Marshall, who's a Scottish Committee member of the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. We're also, as I noted earlier, joined again by Tim Parkin. Um, we move on to a series of questions. I'll kick this session off by asking each of the witnesses, with the exception of uh, Dr Parkin, in one minute to outline their position on the regulations as they are set out. Who wants to go first? Mr Jukes. First, I'll start first, yeah. Um, all right. I think uh, my understanding of the current legislation is that it's not permissible to dot or shorten any um, puppy's tail as a prophylactic measure in Scotland to prevent injury. Um, I think that that was arrived on on the basis of trying to avoid um, what's termed unnecessary mutilations and uh, seen as being generally beneficial for dogs and in many ways I can support that position and I think that in general terms there's no need to do something if it's not going to be a benefit. However, I think um, that it's very clear from my experience and sp speaking to both professional colleagues and also to gamekeepers and people that shoot um, that there is a significant problem and there is a significant problem with working dogs. I think it's important to say it's not just dogs that go shooting, it's also police dogs and dogs taught, um, used for other tasks such as you know, maybe search and rescue dogs or whatever. That, um, and part of that problem may be because they spend a long time in kennels, but also um, due to the work that they do. And I think that um, when you're talking about comparison of pain, having docked um, a reasonable number of dogs' tails in my time, um, you kind of snip the tail, the puppy goes, oh! And then you put it back on the, the bitch's teeth, the puppy starts suckling, and within five minutes the whole litter of sleep once the procedure is finished. Um, by comparison with that, um, injury to dogs can be, as Tim explained, anything from a nick um, to a grossly infected tail. The problem with those is that um, they're difficult to treat. Ask no vet relishes treating a tail that's been injured if it's got to be amputated. It's very difficult to decide how much to amputate. Um, when you do amputate them, um, there's a high risk, high complication rate. Um, some of those dogs heal very quickly. Some of those dogs have very protracted healings and some of them need two or three operations to actually um, sort the problem out. Once they've been through all that, the dogs are, can be quite traumatised. Um, certainly painful and defensive about their tail, so clearly they don't um, appreciate the procedure. Whereas with the puppies, there's no evidence that, uh, from my experience that I can see that in any way there is in that procedure. So I think, yes, you've got to dock a certain number to achieve a certain gain, but the problems, if you have a problem, is a real problem. And um, both for the, for the dogs but, and for the owners too, it's very stressful um, and distressing to see your dogs like that. Um. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Donald. Thank you. Um, I'm a vet of 30 years experience, 25 years were in rural first opinion practice and I personally did talk tails until the ban in 2007 when legislation made it totally unambiguous, rather the, I always preferred it that the vet did it than an illegal lay person did it. However, times change and we now are where we are, so this must all be evidence led and we must never forget that the tail is also an essential part of canine expression, not just um, to talk to themselves about, but to wag and everything else. It, I personally feel it is very painful in pups, just be because they are quiet, you cannot say they are not in pain. They cannot run away from it at five days old. They suckle, I, children suck their thumbs when they're sore. Suckling is a form of comfort. So I, the, there is no anaesthetic, there is no analgesia. We cannot say they are not pain-free. Cats used to be told, I used to say to clients that cats, um, if they slept 23 hours a day and had one healthy, lively hour a day, that was fine. Times change. We know now that they are sleeping because they are sore. The day, we do not have the evidence to say puppies are not sore. Um, 
just the sheer numbers needed um, to uh, shorten, to be able to prevent the um, one amputation. And also, I dispute the uh, injury scale. If they're getting just a scratch or a bruise, that is an injury. But I scratch and bruise my hands in the garden. I do not advocate chopping my children's hands off. Thank you. Dispute the injury scale. What evidence do you have? What figures would you put forward? Well, just in, in the um, first paper, it just said injury. Mm -hmm. There was no definition of that injury. It could just be a scratch. Okay. You know. okay. okay. Thank you for that clarity. Runa Hannigan. Hello. Um, I'm here representing Dogs Trust, which is the largest um, dog welfare charity in the UK, and, and we have um, Scottish branches up here in Glasgow and West Calder. Um, and we are firmly opposed to the docking of, of dogs' tails. Um, we believe that puppies suffer unnecessary pain through that process um, and are deprived of a, a vital form of um, expression, um, particularly from a behaviour element as well. Um, and so we would call to reject the proposals that have been put forwards and the exemptions to be made. Um, the studies that have been carried out have got um, flaws and bias in them, and we are worried that they don't actually have the robust details to stand up to this, um, this exemption to be made. We also are very concerned about the pain element and the behaviour aspect um, and the ethical considerations around this, which haven't been addressed by the papers that have been done more recently. But surely as an animal welfare organisation, you must be concerned about the damage that's done to working dogs' tails. There are, there are cases where damage is, is quite severe, but when you look at the evidence that's been put forward today, um, the amount of puppies that will need to be docked in order to prevent that is significant. You're looking at anything between um, 320 to, to 415, I think, were, were called earlier. So I think that really is an unnecessary amount of dogs that would need to go through docking in order to prevent one amputation. Okay. Uh, Alan Marshall. I'm a vet in general practice uh, and have been for the last 35 years. Um, we're not talking aesthetics here. We are talking about trying to uh, prevent uh, an injury. I think we see these injuries in presumably more in country practice. Um, the injuries we are seeing in the spaniels and hunt point, hunt point retrievers, primarily spaniels, and I think it will depend on what area we're in, which different dogs we're seeing it in, primarily spaniels in my area. Um, they are debilitating. They are working dogs. I think in my books, we want to just try and prevent these painful injuries happening from the start before they get any further. I see numbers, I'm listening to the different numbers we're getting. Uh, in my area, I think I'm seeing a different number. I'm seeing spaniels that are undocked with much more frequent injuries than uh, we're talking about. And I think we have to actually, the working spaniels that are working, uh, I, I see a much bigger number and proportion versus the one to 400 that we heard earlier. Thank you. Let's at this point pick up on, a, on something that came up in the first session um, and explore it with the principally with the three vets who are on the panel. The BVA su uh, submission, which I quoted earlier, says chronic pain can arise from poorly performed docking. What are we getting at there? Are we saying that, that many vets don't have the skills to carry this out, regardless of whether you're in favour of the, the regulations or not, that they don't have the skills required to carry this out? Or is there a suggestion that there is illegal docking going on presently in Scotland? Mr Marshall. I don't think I've seen uh, any chronic pain from incorrect docking, uh, incorrect puppy docking. I think you, you asked the question earlier about illegal docking. Um, I think in the last 10 years, we, have, we might have seen one or two cases where I think Pups have come from uh, dubious uh, backgrounds. Okay, I think uh, vets. We're we're not going to 
none of us are going to put our name on the line. Uh, it doesn't matter how pro-docking we are. I don't think any of us are going to put our name on the line uh, under these circumstances. Okay. Pain-wise, I just don't see this. We're, we're probably going to come back to the um, phantom pain and chronic pain. I don't see it at all. Okay. Uh, Mr Jukes. Um, uh, I think... Um, I'm certainly not aware of um, poorly docked puppy cells. I think there is a right way and a wrong way to dock his puppy cell. And I think that some sort of re-education of the people that are not aware of how to do it would be quite reasonable. Um, I was shown when I first went into practice how we did it in our practice. We certainly weren't taught at college. And I think if that skill is lost in some practice, then um, some sort of training would be useful. Um, but as um, uh, I think um, the, the person said before who had the pigs, I mean, it's, it's relative, sorry, P Peter, um, it's a relatively simple thing. It's one cup with a pair of scissors. You can start to stop the bleeding. It's over in a second. Um, I think, uh, you know, historically, I've seen Spaniards that are docked really, really short and stuff like that. I think it was very clear in the legislation it's got to be a third of the tail. Um, if, if it's people are familiar with the technique, they're going to do it better. Um, I think it's important. So I think it's important to have that education. Um, but I'm not personally aware of lots of puppies that have been badly docked recently. Okay. So, uh, Melissa Donald, what were the BVA driving at with that comment? We're um, against any, any docking, as you're, you're well aware. Um, the main issue would be that uh, there are would need to be research to see if dogs who do have shortened tails um, are more sensitive around the back end. There are a lot of dogs who do not like having their back ends. I don't think anybody has actually done the research to see if this is because they've got shortened tails or not. Historically, it would have been much easier because so many more would have been. But there were a lot of dogs in, in when I was in practice who, uh, the Rottweilers, the Dobermans, who were, were traditionally docked at that time, who certainly did not like us going near the back ends, but nobody would be able to say categorically evidence-based if it was due to the docking. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Karina. Uh, and good morning to the panel. Um, could I ask um, you, Jim Dukes, just in relation to your initial comments, um, that um, you did, I think, say that um, there, there could be um, seriously infected tails in, yeah. in um, adult dogs yes, of the breeds absolutely. we're discussing. Yeah. Um, in what circumstances could that happen? Because, and I, and I don't want to um, in any way cast aspersions on owners, but um, if, if, say, a member of my family had an injury uh, and it looked as if it might be going to go septic, I, I would make sure that we got to the doctor pretty quickly because of the, the risks. And I'm just wondering if that's a management issue or whether there's something more to this. Um, no, I think um, sepsis, as you're probably aware, is probably not um, an absolute thing that if a dog has a cut, it's going to be infected. You know, how big a cut does it need to become infected? Um, and as you'll be aware, there's kind of lots of stuff now we've got to think about the correct use of antimicrobials and that sort of thing and antibiotic resistances where you should actually necessarily treat every little nick and cut and clearly we wouldn't do it to ourselves so why should we be doing it to our dogs so i think um i don't necessarily say that um tail injuries can progress because it's a nasty injury if the, if the injury is bruised and there's damage to the underlying tissue it's not necessarily always easy to assess that from the start but the big problem with a tail is that it's a tail and it sticks out the back and it wags um, and the end of the tail is quite a long way away from the rest of the body, so it's actually quite a, an isolated structure. And if, so if you do get a nick or a cut in there, and infection does set in, and it's not always easy to see initially it does, the second problem is much more difficult to treat, and the infection tends to track down the sides of the tail and down the vertebrae, and if it gets into the bone, um, and it's quite difficult to assess how far down the tail the infection has gone, and that's the problem when you try to dock it, and that's why some dogs end up being docked two or three times. It's difficult. To, nobody wants to take off more tail than they need. But even for vets, it's difficult to assess how far that infection has spread. Um, so I, I don't think that's you could necessarily say that they're infected because they're neglected now. I was asking the question rather than... Yeah. yeah. Um, my original question was directed at the practitioners, but does the dog trust want to make any comment in response to it? Um, I'm a veterinary surgeon and I've oh, been sorry, qualified for 20 years. Yeah, sorry, so I'm very happy to answer that question. <laughs> um, and have only just recently stepped out of clinical work as well. So um, from... 
from my experience, um, having been involved in sort of rural communities as well as um, looking at the, the sort of legislation and the research that's come through for today, um, my concern over the pain and the, the issues around docking, which I think was your question originally, um, is that I have seen poorly docked tails, I have seen litters die because of poorly docked tails, um, and I have huge reservations as to whether we can manage pain um, efficiently enough around that process. Um, and that's our issue with dogs that are under five days old, um, aside from the fact we can't tell if the entire litter is going for working or not. But um, the worry that I have is that pain management has become such an important factor as a veterinary surgeon now, um, and preemptive pain management is just as important now as, um, as it would be in humans. So we can't actually do that with dogs, and we can't do that with puppies at five days old. Um, when we go to the surgery, surgical corrections, we're doing that under general anaesthetic and we're doing that with preemptive pain pain relief on board. So I do have reservations around that. Um, when it comes to the um, the chronic pain issues, I know that from a behavioural element there has been some um, thoughts looking at that. There's a, there's a word called allodynia which explains sort of more sensitive pain issues um, and they're wondering <coughs> whether that's connected to painful procedures when dogs are much younger and sort of neonatal and, and issues like that. So that's where this really sits with us as Dogs Trust. The poorly carried out docking that you've um, seen, was that carried out by a veterinary surgeon? I couldn't confirm that, um, but I have seen a number of litters that have ended up very unwell. Um, and whether that's down to the fact that we're actually cutting and tearing through tissue and that that tear effectively becomes infected, um, or whether there are stress-related stress factors behind that or not, um, it's hard to say. As a vet, often you, you can be presented with these issues late in the day, so it's very hard to try and correct or repair or, or help that litter of puppies. But setting aside the dog's trust's opposition to this, and what just got to get, as, as four veterinary surgeons, um, do you believe that your um, profession could be brought up to speed to carry out these procedures, whether you agree with them or not, fairly quickly, so that vets could carry the, this out if they so wish to? Yeah, Jim Dukes. Absolutely, yeah. I, mean, I think there's there are plenty of vets. Um, I've spent the last week phoning around um, colleagues, partners in general practice, a number of practices across Aberdeenshire, um, and there's a number of them who've carried out docking before um, who are absolutely believe it's the right thing to do, and as soon as it's allowed to do it, they're quite happy to go ahead and do the procedure. Um, I'm sure that they would be perfectly um, willing to become involved in educating the younger colleagues, but I think... Um, so I think there are already people who are perfectly qualified to do this. Um, I think that um, some sort of training or register or whatever would be relatively simple to set up if you wanted to do that. Yeah. With respect, some people from outside might say that you would say that given the views you hold on the subject. I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm really trying to press the two witnesses who are anti this on whether they accept that the skills are out there in their profession, whether you agree with us or not, that this procedure could be carried out effectively um, by your colleagues. I think if you, if you mean effectively by the fact the tail is shortened, then that will be possible. But I don't think that we're taking into account the holistic side of this, which is the pain that the puppies may mm. experience. But the skills are there that this could be done, whether you agree or disagree with it. I don't know if... Um, this would be as easy t to get, like, a suitable CPD to organise on this. Um, mostly because there'd be very few teachers out there who would be willing to do teach this procedure without pain relief, and, which, we, uh, as we've just said, cannot do. So how do you show somebody how to do it and gold standard, which is what we need, with no pain relief? Okay. So. Okay, thank you. I'm going to let Peter Chapman in. Yeah, I, I want to come. I want to explore this, this this pain relief thing a bit more. I mean, as I said earlier, I I'm a farmer and have been a farmer for all my days, and I've I've tail docked thousands of pigs in my time, and I've never never known a pig to die because because we've tail docked it. I've never seen that, you know. And I, as I say, I have a long number of years' experience of doing this, and I did it myself with just a snip, and it's a way. And in my experience, there's a, there's a, a squeak, 
you put the pig back down and within 10 minutes everything's back to normal. And I've never seen a pig die. And a pig's a very highly intelligent animal, we all agreed on that. And it's still regularly done. Um, so I don't know why we're getting so hung up on, on, on tail dog and a few, few puppies, to be perfectly honest. And that's, my, that's where I come from, and I'll be perfectly honest about that. Um, so I just wonder, what the, the two ladies in the middle there, who are also obviously against this, what's your thoughts about tail docking pigs? Because you know it's, an, it's a it's a it's a sentient feeling animal, and, and it's it's done on a regular basis, and it's it's a different animal, I accept, but it, it's the same it's the same procedure in my opinion. Melissa uh, Donald, going to go first. <laughs> I totally understand why you're saying that but there is evidence to show that because of the tail biting that the well the benefit is clear i think it's at um for, to prevent tail biting you have to uh trim two tails to prevent one tail bite as opposed to a hundred puppies need docked pigs do not last for 12 years they do not wag their tails as part of their expression and again, for the reasons I said before, just because they don't seem to be in pain, they're also running around, they're also more developed, but just because they're not, I'm sure they would be running away rather than having it done. And then they go and suckle, which as I say, is a comfort thing. Um, it's a very much a perception thing, but on a welfare benefit, it is most definitely worth doing the pigs because a, they're not living as long, and secondly, it prevents tail biting, which, as um, Jim pointed out earlier, the, the end of the tail is a very handy thing for another pig to grab a hold of. I mm -hmm. also wonder how many, as a percentage, you may not have seen them die, but have some degree of condemnation because of abscessing along the spine from incorrectly done. Well, I mean, I would say the only time I've seen abscesses along the spine is when they, they, they get tail bitten, not when you, you not when you trim the tail. I've never seen that. But if they get tail bitten, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, but they don't live for 13 years. Mm. I think um, that that particular question is very difficult for me to answer coming from a dog charity. Well, fair enough. Oh, so <laughs> okay. um, I, I can't say that I've done much pig practice, no. I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Let's move this on. Uh, Finlay Carson. So I'm now going to move on to the views on the research from Glasgow University, which the responses have been uh, quite diverse. Some uh, organisations saying that they don't believe that scientifically, uh, it, it's scientifically robust enough. Other organisations strongly believing the evidence presented uh, confirms the pain docking uh, outweighs the avoidance of more serious tail injuries. So I'd like to ask the members of the panel, do they think the research conducted by Glasgow University provides a robust basis for a change in the law, but equally importantly, when you answer, can you, can you let us know whether there's uh, scientific research that you've done that supports your argument? The thing about the Glasgow study is at least it is a piece of research and it does have some fairly strong conclusions. Um, and I think Tim would argue that they're fairly robust. I think the problem is, that otherwise it's a bit of conjecture and like local experience, local knowledge. Um, what I would say in terms of my research is I haven't, um, I haven't, I have done a telephone poll of as many gamekeepers as I could speak to in the last fortnight since I knew I was coming here, and as many practitioners as I could. I didn't speak to one gamekeeper who didn't believe that tail docking should be reintroduced. Um, I think people would argue that it's for cosmetic grounds or whatever. I don't notice them shopping in Burberry's or down in Oxford Street or whatever. You know, I think they're interested in their dogs for work. They love their dogs. They're not doing it because they want to in any way disfigure or harm their dog. They're doing it because they find it's difficult to work their dogs without them. Um, also, on that same evidence, there's... When you're looking at these statistics, I think you have to bear in mind that it is still legal to dock puppies in England and it is still legal to dock them in Ireland. And a significant number of the keepers I spoke to would no longer buy a puppy from Scotland and they only ever source puppies from England or from Ireland because they will only work dock puppies. Um, so, in fact, the number of injuries reported may be an underreporting of the breed because this, the working ones are still being docked because they're being sourced from elsewhere. So I think it may be a problem that's actually more significant than you think. If you speak to people that have undocked puppies that work them, then um, they have had horrific injuries, some of them, quite frankly. And, you know, and I've also spoken to people who have given up breeding Spaniels in Scotland um, 
who had big litters and have been breeding them for 15, 20 years, it's been their sort of life's work, if you like, or 30 years, have stopped breeding because they wouldn't work puppies when their tails weren't docked. So, you know, I think speaking to people, if that's evidence, um, there's absolute strong support amongst that community um, for docking because they honestly believe in their dogs, they need their dogs, their dogs are tools for work, um, and they say it's a vital resource and they just hate to see them injured, and, uh, you know, it's just not pleasant. Yeah, I, the BVA, we were really disappointed in the uh, numbers who actually responded. It was um, a self-selecting sample of only 1,005 respondents um, and just under 3,000 dogs. So um, con considering how passionate the people are about, we were really surprised by the low numbers of people who actually did the survey. Um, so therefore there is an overestimation of the risk of injury. And although 29% of those completing the survey reported that one or more of the dogs had sustained a tail injury, only 103 dogs, that's 4.4% of um, received a tail injury that actually went to need to see a vet. A lot of the evidence that was gathered was anecdotal. Uh, owners weren't required to pr provide evidence. Uh, they're again, causing an overestimation. Um, um, from the two studies that were performed, um, looking at them, we've got a, a sort of um, a more qualitative view, which is the letter review looking at the survey. Um, and when you're looking at surveys, you do really want to get quite a high percentage of people responding. Um, and our concern is that there's um, perhaps a 5% uh, response rate compared to the number of people that were potentially polled with that survey. Um, I think most surveys like that you'd want to be reaching at least sort of 30 40 percent so it's quite a low response rate which gives a bias and perhaps an overestimation of the problem that we are seeing um, and i think coming back to the cameron study which is more quantitative looking at the numbers of dogs um, i think we still also have concerns over the bias that's within that paper um, looking at the number of vet practices that did participate um, when you look back in research to the diesel study they actually um, state that some practices declared not to participate because they felt that this was such an emotive topic they didn't want to have their figures on the line. Um, and so I think I'm, I have concerns over the numbers of practices that did participate, but actually with the Cameron study, um, there's quite a large number of dogs that they're suggesting need to be docked in order pre to prevent one injury or to prevent one tail amputation. So I still think that there are problems with both of those studies as they stand. I think the, the, the Glasgow survey uh, from, from recollection, looked at uh, injuries over one year. Uh, I think at that stage, my big, my big anxiety with that was the fact that one year of a dog's life, one year of a working dog's life is merely one year of a working dog's life. Um, uh, I had a dog in training at the time, a Cocker Spaniel in training at the time, who didn't sustain an injury during that period, but we're looking for 10 years work, perhaps eight, 10 years work out of, out of the dog. Um, and the dog subsequently uh, had an injury and had to have a tail amputation. So I'm coming from this from a, sorry, personal point of view. And, I, and that's, where I, that's where I keep seeing these things, where, where I see the problem. Okay, Tim Parkin. A little defence, maybe. Um, uh, I just want to point out, with respect to the response rate, there is no way of uh, calculating response rate in this type of study where you're doing an online survey where you've sent emails or it's been publicised on a website. You have a number of people who may respond. A good proportion of those are very unlikely to have seen the questionnaire or the invitation to respond to the questionnaire. We simply don't have any idea how many of those who actually were aware of the questionnaire did and didn't respond. So quoting a 5% response rate is, is not correct. You cannot define a response rate in this particular survey. Okay, Mark Roscoe. A couple of answers questions from the first panel. Um, firstly, how many hunt point retrievers and spaniels that are working uh, are actually living in, in Scotland today? I, th I think we. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. How, I don't know how, how to answer that question. Jim said earlier. Uh, With a number would be quite good, or even a, an estimate. 
I think I think it's numbers living or numbers of new pups coming in. Okay, let, 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 let's say the entire population of working dogs broken down by hunt point retrievers and spaniels. Because that appears to be a figure that's not in the study. And no. Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? Tens of thousands. 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 Yeah. How many tens of thousands? The, the kennel club, I suggest, may have a record on... They will know exactly how many litters are registered every year. Mm. And I was thinking it would be interesting to look back and see if there were less litters registered now since the ban than before, if there's slightly more in England. And whether you could see if those dogs moved to Scotland or not might be an interesting thing for you to find out. I don't know. OK. Can I also just go back to the issue of evidence around behavioural issues, potentially behavioural issues between dogs that have had their tails docked? That wasn't the remit of this study, but it seems that there's veterinary evidence out there to suggest that that's a risk and that may impact on the number of cases of dog-on-dog -dog interactions that, that come into vet surgeries. So, uh, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the evidence on that? Dog-on-dog... Dog -on -dog interactions, I think back to, let's call, let's, let's talk about canine expression or communication. I think the, the breeds we are talking about here, the Spaniel breed, the Hunt Point Retrievers, are, I would suggest, very expressive, okay? I think some of the dogs, it was talked about earlier, these are probably not the, the dogs that will tend to be involved with dog-to-dog -dog aggression. Uh, uh, two, two breeds I've passed comment on here. On here. Certain breeds, facial, co facial expression is less easy to read, and I'm talking about probably Boxer, Sharpe, and each of the vets can come up with a similar breed that we can't read very readily. I think if we can't read them, dogs are a damn sight better than we are at reading them, but I think other dogs will have difficulty reading some of these breeds as well. I think our... Uh, the working breeds we are talking about here are fairly easy to read and even if they had a, a partly dock tail, a, a two-thirds tail, I think other dogs will read them quite well. Do you have evidence on that? I'm hearing a lot of kind of fairly, possibly, I would, I would assume, you know, words like that. I mean, where, where's the actual studies and the evidence on this? Can I ask the other panel members, do we actually have evidence on this? Because I read out the quote in the earlier panel um, from somebody who's a um, European veterinary specialist in behavioural medicine. Keith is, um, is one of the sort of eminent behavior, veterinary behaviourists in the, in the country. Um, and we've got another lady called Rachel Casey who works with us as well. Um, as far as the research and the studies that have been done on this, I'm not entirely sure that I'm the best person to, to perhaps... Um, say if there are or aren't studies out there. However, the, um, the issue that we do have is that, um, as you were saying, um, it may be that we can't read the dog's behaviour. If we're looking to actually dock um, six puppies in a litter and one of them goes on to being a working dog, the other five dogs are going to end up within family homes. Um, and actually, as humans and as the public, we know as an organisation, reading dog's behaviour is one of the hardest things to teach people. Um, and so if we don't have that other element, which is the dog's tail as well, we can't possibly work out whether the the signs that they're giving us perhaps are warning signs or concern signs or fear signs that they might have. So you, are you saying then that that's a risk to humans? Um, I'm saying that it's a risk to dog-to-dog to, um, -to -dog interactions and also to us understanding what the dog is trying to, to say to us as, as vets in practice or as members of the public as well. Um, and I think um, it's really important that we are not ignoring the fact that this is a, um, an element of dog expression um, and communication. And I think your, your quote earlier about taking away an element of speech is very important. And it's certainly something that's echoed um, by our organisation in the fact that taking this um, stance, taking the dog's tail um, and amputating it is going to take away that element of expression for them. Richard Lyle. Yes. Um, basically, we have regulations that are stating that the vet who carries out docking must be satisfied that there is evidence showing that the dog is likely to be used for work in connection with uh, lawful shooting on animals. In practice, how would that work? 
Um, I think um, it's clearly very difficult to, as everyone's already alluded to, to decide um, whether the dog is going to be working or not. Um, and I think, but there are certainly people, I think you could make a very simple thing for showing dogs, as in England and Wales, that would be illegal to show a docked puppy so that it wouldn't be encouraged as like a breed standard and the breed standard to have a, an undocked or unshortened tail. I think that um, clearly most practices who are in rural areas would know who the gamekeepers were and who the people who were keen sh shooters were. Um, and those people who had enthusiasm of breeding dogs for shooting would be fairly easy for your local practitioner to identify. And I think that's why it's important, as Alan was kind of saying, that you kind of having that local local knowledge is important. And I think, um, but at the end of the day, it would be down to the individual. I think what we're suggesting is it's a procedure that's a essentially prophylactic procedure to reduce the risk of injury. And it would be on an individual case by case basis for the vet to decide um, on the merits or otherwise of that. And he could make his own decision. I think it's important that we allow a vet to make their own decision. But I think that most times in general practice, you, you know, the dogs are specifically bred for either for pets or for, or for showing or for working. Um, they're not all going to go there, but we already know that. But I think that there is enough information um, for, for vets to be able to base that decision um, on. But to pick up on, on the point that was following on from Mr Lyle's question that we touched on earlier, can we uh, confidently anticipate that the element of the regulations where the emphasis is on the vet to make a determination that that will be seen through if a substantial number of vets, as would be their right, opted out of carrying out this procedure. Um, we could, I, I would suggest, I, I, the question I pose is, um, how can we be sure that any vet that was making the determination actually knew the breeder sufficiently well to be confident that the dogs were going to be used for a working purpose? Alan Marshall. I think the, the draft legislation talks about evidence. Um, currently, the, the English and Welsh legislation uh, appears to be quite open. I think, we've <clears throat> I, th I think firearms or shotgun certificates are clearly one possibility. Membership of a, a shooting... Um, Shooting syndicate might be another possibility. Uh, perhaps a letter from a gamekeeper that you are a, a bona fide um, beater, or perhaps you have uh, a stocking um, a stocking uh, facility that you're able to to bring uh, bring forward to to the vet might be sufficient evidence. Uh, Melissa Dong, I mean, the BVA has a position on this as an organisation, but your membership will be split. There will be members who will be prepared to carry this out. Can you give us a kind of ballpark figure of what percentage of your members you would anticipate if this legislation was passed would take a principled stance of not doing it? I haven't got any absolute figures, but having worked with a, a lot of uh, younger members of, of the profession, I would say the vast majority of them would not do it, which then leads into the fact that you would then have to travel with this bitch and young pups to find a vet who would do it, who then does not know you, which then there is an instant flaw in the system. Alan Marshall. Can I come back on that? Uh, currently, the, the situation in Scotland, as uh, Jim Dukes has suggested, is... Many breeders have stopped breeding in Scotland. We have, in the last 10 years, has introduced another welfare problem in Scotland where people with uh, wanting to breed their spaniel or hunt point retrievers, bitches, have to take them to, to comply with the law. They end up travelling south with a pregnant bitch, getting them duly docked, legally docked, south of the border, and then coming back up. Okay? So we have still uh, quite a welfare issue with that. Clearly, south of the border, they are not aware of any background. I have a much better background. Jim has a much better background of the people that we see or are likely to see. Okay, Jim Jukes. A couple of things on that. I think, um, again, I did, as well as phoning a number of keepers, I phoned as many vet practices as I could get hold of and spoke to the principal partners. and. 
Um, all right, it's not a, a, a big survey, but um, roughly half of them are very keen and desperate to see it come back to senior partners and we'd be happy to do it straight away. Um, some practices certainly said they wouldn't be prepared to do it under any circumstances. And then in the middle, um, the practice that said that they weren't really welcoming the reintroduction of it, but if they thought that it could be justified, they would do it in certain cases. Um, I think what those people expressed um, as being important was that the definitions were very clear to them, so it's easier for them to make a decision. And I think that's important to try and come up with some legislation that's easy to understand and easy to follow. Um, I also think within that, and talking about the breeds, it's really important to not water down this legislation by making it too vague as to what the breeds are and to be very, very specific about what can and can't be done would be very, very useful to ensure that it is targeted as effectively as possible. OK. Can I ask Jim Dukes and Melissa Donald specifically, within the, the split that you've identified, is there a split between urban and rural practices? I personally don't think so because, as I say, I was in a fairly rural area where we did have some of my clients were... Um, gamekeepers and shooters um, and and kept dogs for working in this and so I don't think so although we were in small town I don't I don't think so there's not that much Jim Dukes um, I think um, we're talking about sampling bias it's important to understand that um, the shooting fraternity is quite a small fraternity and um, my understanding particularly speaking to the gamekeepers as well is that they tend to speak about which vets are perhaps sympathetic towards shooting and tend to go to them. So some practices would see a higher percentage of actual working dogs, never mind the Spaniels, okay. than others. And in those practices that saw them, then they were definitely in favour. There were certainly some rural practices that I spoke to that were not in favour, but then they also said they didn't see tail injuries and in, in, in working breeds. Um, and so they didn't really understand why, but my suggestion would be that perhaps that's either because of um, the way that randomness works anyway, that certain, you'll see clusters of cases in certain places, or it will be that the shooting fraternity kind of votes with their feet and goes to the people that they know are going to be sympathetic. So some practices see a large number of injuries, some practices don't see any, and so therefore... Okay, okay. thanks. Richard Lyon. Yes, my question is, is mainly to Mr Dukes and Mr Marshall, and I asked Mr, uh, Dr Parkin this question in the last panel. The overall prevalence of any uh, tail injury amongst dogs of all breeds was 0.59% between 2002 and 2012. and working dogs, it was 0.90% between 2002 and 2012. So why, I've already asked you the question, Mr. Parkin, but why is, um, you know, why, why do you support this when it's shown that it's not really happening all that often? I think Mr Parkin wants to come in before anybody else answers that. Can I, I just want to make it, it's not working dogs, it's working dog breeds. Yeah, working dog breeds. Sorry, you, I didn't. That's fine. I, I should have put my glasses on for no, that. That's fine, I do no apologise. Thank, okay, thank you. Thank you for that Working clarification. dog breeds. I think we've got an easy answer for uh, for that one. Uh, and I don't, the figure, the figure that's being quoted here is not the figure I see. Um, I think throughout the country, and it doesn't matter whether it's Dumfrieshire, Ayrshire, uh, Aberdeenshire, or down, down parts of England, I think we have different dog breeds and dog types. I think we also have different uh, habitat types, different cover um, that dogs maybe work through. Um, I see, I recognise a, a different figure I'm not a. I'm a general practitioner. I don't do research. I don't keep the numbers uh, that we've just been talking about. That is not the figure I recognise and see. Before Mr. Dukes comes in with his answer, I think you said earlier on, Mr. Marshall, that you've been a vet for over 30 years, 35 years, if my memory serves me right. Um, how many, many tail tail injuries have you seen in that time? I know you don't maybe keep that, that record particularly? We don't, we don't keep that record. I would, I think, do I see half a dozen tail injuries a year? I think that's, a, that's a, it's an awkward question. I think if I see half a dozen tail injuries a year, um, um, 
Uh, and but, you know, so I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing tail injuries. I'm aware of what we're also not seeing tail injuries uh, because the perhaps the the gamekeeping profession will tend to sort problems out themselves. Uh, and although, uh, you know, I think if they've got a major problem, they're always going to see their vet, but they may not always come to the vet. As, as a vet, you know, <clears throat> I used to have two Yorkshire Terriers. As a vet, you, you'll see hundreds of dogs a month. Yes. So you've only seen uh, an average in a, in a year uh, six um, tail injuries. I categorically did not say six. I said maybe half a dozen. I'm not. I'm not splitting hairs. <laughs> You're trying to put numbers on me. I'm not putting numbers on it. Okay. I do see tail injuries. Uh, we we see them infrequently, but when we see them, they are really quite, they potentially yeah, I, are. Yeah, I can serious. understand. Is that working? Sorry, Kadina. Uh, are these working dog breeds? Or are they just ordinary, like, as I say, I had two Yorkshire Terriers who, who like to run through the the, 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 the undergrowth and, and it, whatever? It, it will tend to be working dog breeds. I think we haven't got to, you know, why why are we talking um, the Spaniels and the Hunt Point Retrievers? And I'm not sure if we're coming on to this. I see the Spaniels as having a very, very fast tail wag. It's non-stop. I've got a very... I look at them, they've got a very fine hair on the tail. Uh, the hair does tend to get caught. It doesn't get caught first time they're through the brush, but it maybe gets caught and a few hairs get removed each time they're through another bit of brush or bramble or gorse. And it just, more hairs get lost, more hairs get lost, and then we've got bare areas that start getting traumatised. They're easily traumatised, and as... As that goes on, that's where we get the the problem. Just get becomes more more evident with time. Um, it's, it's steered away from your it's steered away from your question, but the the problem is coming in a different way. Uh, Mr. Duke, I know it's time to come in, but basically the question I want to ask you, as a dog lover, why should we have this law when it's not happening? Very often, yeah, you know, our, our, our people are not bringing them to the vets. Okay, you're saying that they could be taking care of it themselves at home, uh, treating their dog. But you're not seeing all that in your 35 years. You've not seen all that many cases. Okay, uh, in that case, back to your back to your original question. Why am I not seeing them? Because in our part of the country, most people will not work a dog with a full tail. Most people in my part of the country will still be um, bringing pups in from south of the border or from somewhere else. The, 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 the gun dog working population knows what the problem is. Uh, very particularly, we know exactly what the problem is the, and will tend to source a, a new pup from somewhere that is already tail docked or tail shortened. Thank you. Well, I think... Um probably Alan to just answer it, that actually that might be quite a good result, mind it, that might demonstrate the benefits of docking it, that you bring the risk of tail injuries down roughly to the level of the rest of the population. Um, if that was surveyed against only undocked working dogs, I'm sure it wouldn't be 0.9 of a percent, it would be like 20%, 50%, whatever, depending on who you speak to, as Tim has alluded to, five, you know, I think it's just a statistic and it doesn't really mean very much because it's not qualified. Thank you. I, I've got a tangential question, but before I ask it, um, I, I, I want to be clear, this is not a loaded question and not casting aspersions against the profession, because I think everybody around the table today is coming at this from an animal welfare perspective, whatever side of the argument you're on. So let, let's take that as a given. But I'd like a bit of an understanding of the costs involved in this. What would the costs be for tail shortening? and set against the costs that are incurred by owners where dogs are having their tails in later life severely damaged or having to be amputated. And, and I guess what is the income to veterinary practices from that? Um, from, I, I don't know what people are going to wish to charge for 
um, shortening a puppy's tail at three to five days old, but you know, I'd imagine five to ten pounds per puppy would be perhaps a reasonable figure, would it? I don't know. If you did a litter of six, I, I, you know, I don't know what people are going to charge, and I think that's pr pretty much. I do have figures for um, docking of injured spaniels. Um, I give you just two figures from one person. They took one dog to one vet. Um, it took them. Um, they were quoted four hundred pounds. It in the end cost them eight hundred pounds. Um, they were told it would be two weeks. It took nine weeks for the dog to get better, and it, it basically was a, a, a big problem. Um, another dog maybe 200 pounds, so, but you're talking in the hundreds to maybe up to a thousand pounds or more in, if you have a difficult case that needs to be on several times. Now, for a gamekeeper, that represents a significant part of their salary, and they're not always supported by um, their bosses to pay those bills, so for some people it's a significant sum as compared to a, it's like buying insurance, the insurance is cheap if you have an accident, it's expensive. I've never heard the gamekeeper talk about the cost. I've heard them talking about the animal welfare aspect mm -hmm. of it, only in fairness to, to that profession. What about the others? I mean, what's the, what's the charge in, in England? I'm afraid it's not something that I've ever done or charged for, so I couldn't mm -hmm. answer that question myself. Um, I'm not entirely sure what um, practices in England um, or Ireland would charge for that. I've, I've worked over in Southern Ireland myself as well, so um, I'm really not aware of the costs for that. Um, the costs, when, it look, when we're looking at amputating the tail later in life, involve an anaesthetic and pain relief, so the, the costs of that are instantly going to increase because of that, um, but it's a very important part when we're trying to maintain animal welfare. Mm -hmm. Melissa Donald. Yeah, uh, the current price, I would say, of... of I'm just taking an adult dog tail if with no complications would be about 200 250 pounds um, we have to remember that pricing for puppy docking is 10 years out of date when mm. we were doing it at very different times um, and it was done as a nominal fee um, and I would agree at that point it was probably five to ten pounds back in that day whether that would still go ahead mm. at today's prices I have no idea mm -hmm but add a bit of inflation for that period and we're probably... In the yeah, a, and ethical considerations as well. Yeah. Um, making sure people really think about what they're doing price-wise. Uh, mm. It really was a nominal fee. It, it's Ten years ago, the profession probably wasn't as professional about charging as it is now. OK, OK. I just thought it was worth an area worth exploring. Um, let's move on. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to drill a little deeper with the panel, but if you've already made comment on, on this, we'll, we'll, um, we'll have that noted already in the official report. Um, I'd like to, uh, to ask some questions about the pain and stress associated with the docking of tails of puppies and how, and if anyone's able to comment, um, if they haven't done yet or further, on the pain and stress of working dogs sustaining tail injuries later in life. And... Um, some, some of the submissions, um, without pointing to any at the moment, have have made some assertions without um, what would appear to be evidence for um, these arguments. And it would be helpful um, if we could stick to any actual evidence, um, whether it's you know from your own personal experience or whether it's from um, uh, research which has been done. The dog stress statement that was submitted, um, we referenced Noonan in um, the study that they did when they looked at 50 puppies, um, and that was around the procedure of tail docking, um, and they found that the puppies, all the puppies struggled and vocali vocalised intensely, um, and repeatedly as well. Um, at the time of amputati amputation. I think one of the points that Melissa made earlier was, um, was also important to note in the fact that our understanding as, vet as a vet veterinary profession in pain and recognising signs of pain is developing. Um, and no more so than in the world of cats, which again, I'm probably stepping out of my comfort zone to talk about, but um, in the world of cats, we're looking at pain being seen as cats that are quiet and perhaps reserved and retreating to the back of their kennel or, or going on hiding. Um, and I think the work that's done within the human field, and I think, Emma, you'd mentioned this earlier, that you'd seen um, research or been involved in research around this um, on pain scales and pain management um, in 
paediatrics. I think it's really important that we, we look across different skills and different professions to try and understand what that does mean. Um, the pain scores and the, the, um, the pain tools that we have are made for dogs are put together and validated for dogs that are in chronic pain more often than not um, and around surgery which is dogs that are sort of more adult and having general anaesthetics I don't know of any that have been validated for puppies under five days of age to be able to help us understand and tease that out are there other comments through the convener I can maybe come on that as um if um we all know that it's pretty difficult to decide to measure pain in animals, in all animals, and particularly in puppies that are, um, to all intents and purposes, blind and don't really move, and it's very difficult to assess. So we can't assess that. But if you know, you keep going on about the puppies vocalising yelp several times, um, I think the Dogs Trust, as you're aware, has strongly promoted the microchipping of puppies. If you've ever littered microchipped a litter of puppies at eight weeks old and you measure vocalisation in them, it would perhaps be 100 times what they would make at three days old when they're... So are they in more pain microchipping than they are when they're told. You know, I just think it's, it's not a, really a worthy way of assessing pain. And I... No, I, I understand what you're saying, actually, in, in trying to weigh up and validate the scales that we have to look at. I think microchipping is a very different procedure to cutting and tearing the puppy's tail um, at the five-day mark. Um, so I think it's a very different procedure to be trying to justify that argument with. Um, microchipping is an injection, and... Um, that's straightforward. We, we all have injections and, and dogs undergo injections all the time on vaccinations and preventative health care. Um, but when we're talking about tail docking, um, you're trying to perhaps um, weigh up two very different procedures where actually we are cutting and tearing through tissue um, and through bone potentially with the puppy. So it, it is a very difficult one to answer because it isn't really a, an equal comparison when you're looking at the, the techniques that we're using. No, but I think using things like vocalisation is being emotive too, and I think that it's very, very difficult to assess whether or not the puppies truly do suffer pain. They certainly don't appear to have a growth check. Um, in my experience, they just carry on as normal. And if you compare, if you take um, an evidence of chronic pain as ill, th Ill thriving, I don't think there's any evidence that puppies that are not grow any slower than ones that are not. And, being, and, and maybe those sort of things to look at would be more useful. Um, but so, in, in my view, just to, to, to any suggestion that um, any puppy that suffers chronic pain is based purely on um, sort of an emotive assessment of pain and not really on any science. Okay. I right. Can I, I come back in? Yeah, can I come back in on that? Um, uh, just for clarification on that particular issue, um, in the written submission to the committee, the BS, uh, sorry, BASC state, it should be noted that the pain associated with the shortening of puppies' tails has been seen as comparable with that associated with microchipping a dog no legal requirement in Scotland. And I'm just seeking clarification as to um, what the evidence for, for that is, because we really need to drill down into where the evidence for these issues is and the, the degree to which it's a, a perception or, you know, um, or, or actual evidence. I think that's pr probably, probably anecdotal evidence. Um, and certainly from my point of view, I see the... Uh, the discomfort from microchipping pups as, 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 as Jim Duke says, almost comparable. I think it's uh, the, we, get, we get a response, we always get a response with microchipping. Sometimes it can be quite severe. I don't know if we end up with a microchip sitting right next to a nerve. We've got some dogs that really take that quite uncomfortably and then they will settle down again fairly quickly. Right. Um, are there any other comments on the um, any comparison between the the welfare and pain and stress issues in relation to um, the um, tail docking uh, of puppies and the and the stress and pain for um, for adult dogs to in relation to um, necessary amputation or injury that haven't yet been made and um, let's look at the evidence base please. Well we we haven't spoken about the pain and distress with the adults, um, but I, th I think it is quite clear that they do have um, analgesia. It is done under a general anaesthetic. That, that is 100% is evidence on that. They all have to be. But each, each injury is very individual. 
but it can be done that if the pain control is good, there should be very few complications afterwards. If the antibiotic level is covered, because these are usually dirty injuries to start with, um, then uh, the, the pain level, the, the complications do come where, as has been said before, maybe not quite has been taken and enough has been taken off usually because of owner wanting to preserve as much tail as possible. Um, and a lot of the times the um, docking is done because of the chronicity of the wound. It won't stop bleeding. And if anybody has actually seen somebody's kitchen, it is quite distressing. But it's not necessarily painful, as, as painful as, as it appears. It's more that it looks awful and, and it is a quick solution um, trying to get one of these tails to heal without amputation it can take several weeks and so it is a quick solution a cost-effective solution which is why it's often offered early on right. um, Emma Harper come in here thank you convener um, um, thank you Alan for Arnold Marshall for clarifying the particular wagging tail behaviour that leads to the mechanism of injury of the long-tailed um, spaniels. It's actually quite good to hear about that and, uh, you know, and how these dogs end up with an injury in the first place. I'm interested to know about the, since the ban 10 years ago, what has been the alternative practice that has been employed? Because surely you've not just sent the dogs out doing nothing. So have we done things like Vaseline, cutting the tail, tail protectors, tail wrapping. I believe in the USA they do other things, but those were pointers that I was specifically looking at, which might be difficult to wrap a tail on a spaniel, for instance. I think, yes, I, I, heard, I heard the question earlier, and I think we can and do wrap tails and try and offer them protection and try and give them time to heal. I think we will. I think we'll, all of the vets in general practice will tend to do that first, way before we talk about amputation. Um, so I think I think we will try and offer that protection and a degree of comfort to the dog, so it's less likely to get to get knocked. Um, I, I, the the previous comment about uh, tail amputation in the adult dog, I'll dispute. Because in the tail amputation in the adult dog, by that stage, the dog has invariably gone through two or three months of pain and discomfort. It doesn't matter how much we try and wrap it. Invariably, if it is at all excoriated, if it's raw at all, there's, there's got to be some discomfort going on with that, even if we are wrapping it. So that dog's invariably remained in a level of discomfort until we get to the stage of either full healing or adult adult dog amputation. So even even though we're wrapping it, I think we're trying to protect it by wrapping it and trying to give it a chance to heal. But I think very often there's still some level of discomfort with that dog until we get it there. There's no doubt when we amputate the tail, we are given an, ampute, an adult tail the dog will get the full the full gamut of analgesics, painkillers, antibiotics, or whatever. But but it still is invariably quite a healing process. It is not just like it is not just the dog's had a cut, which seems to heal remarkably quickly. The tail healing remains always a slow a, a slow uh, process. So I think, just to clarify, I mean, are we sending dogs out to forget the vet injury or the practice? If we're taking dogs out to shoot, are we using Vaseline and cutting their tails, or does that work as an alternative? As an idea, and I think um, what you've got to realise is Scotland's a pretty wet country, so if you stuck a bandage on or whatever, it's going to, it's going to get soggy and fall off, whatever you did. And if you're working through thick brambles and thorns or whatever, which is really what these spaniels are ideal for, and that's what they're bred to do, um, then it's going to be impossible to keep any sort of dressing on a dog all day working through the wet and muddy ground. So I'm not sure that's really an option. I have never um, come across anyone with the idea of Vaseline. I'm sure if someone had an injury, they would put Vaseline or something on to try and prevent it getting worse. Um, but I haven't actually seen it used in the field at all as a prophylactic idea. 
Okay. Claudia Beamish, you want to come back? Right, uh, yeah, thank you, convener. Um, it was building on um, Richard Lyle's question, just to um, see if there are any more comments on um, uh, proportionality. And based on the figures provided uh, in the Glasgow University um, research or other specific research about the numbers of puppies it would require to have their tails shortened to prevent one tail injury, um, are, are there comments on that? And is it, um, in the view of the panel, proportionate? I think certainly from, from Dog's Trust perspective, I think that um, it isn't proportionate to the risk that's posed. Um, so I think the fact that we started off with the diesel research suggesting that 500 dogs would need, or puppies would need docking to prevent one injury. Um, we've moved forward to um, Tim's research um, with Cameron and Lederer. Um, and I think even in those studies, we can see that there's a large proportion of dogs, of puppies that will need to be docked in order to prevent the injury. Um, and I think the worry about the owner-led research is that it's owner reporting, and we don't have any clarification on what that, en that injury actually is. Um, and that's where the, the figures are the lowest. Um, when we look at the veterinary-led ones, we've actually got a higher number of puppies that would need to be docked um, to prevent one injury. You're at an animal welfare organisation. You cannot be comfortable with the damage that's done to all the tails of older working dogs. I mean, we've all seen some pretty horrific pictures. What's the alternative to this? Is, is do nothing the best way forward? I think uh, Emma was quite right in perhaps asking about what options have been explored mm -hmm. um, in the time frame that we've had where dogs have been working and docking has been ex it's been um, illegal to dock in Scotland. Um, and I think it's, in, it's one of the things, again, that Diesel brought up was looking at tail coat, um, coat type and um, tail length with the hair um, mm. and whether that's a factor in these dogs catching. Um, so I, I'm not somebody who can probably comment on that particularly, mm. but I do wonder whether there are other ways of, of trying to manage it. Um, I think certainly when you look at um, horses that are competing, they'll often be Vaseline to mm. try and avoid injury. Um, and so perhaps cutting the tail hair, using Vaseline, those sorts of things would help to avoid the damage. But I'm not in the... Um, I'm not a hunting, shooting, fishing person, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Sorry, to go back to Cordia's original point. So, how do you want to come in on that? Just on the thing of docking puppies versus docking adults, and how many would you have to dock? I think the issue is really the answer that none of us can give is how much pain do the puppies feel because it's almost impossible to say. But it would appear. Um, from as far as we can tell, looking at their behaviour, the way they grow, that um, and the lack of um, problems post docking, if it's done by a, a vet who's experienced and knows what he's doing, um, compared to um, a dog that injures its tail that potentially faces weeks or months, um, or sometimes even longer than that of injuries. And if anyone's had, like, even an infected fingernail and it throbs and it throbs all day and it doesn't go away, and you can take some paracetamol, you can take what you want, you know, I'm sorry, but. Analgesia as analgesia, and maybe short term during the operation in the 12 hours, 18 hours afterwards, you can perhaps provide really good pain um, cover. You can't provide it in the two, three months before when the dog is really sore. You can't provide it in the two, three months afterwards that some of these dogs take to heal. Um, so you can't control pain in those dogs, and there's no question that some of those dogs suffer and show pain. What The reason why um, the keepers in particular so strongly want this done is because they don't want to see their dogs in pain, and they com compare one against the other, and they see one as really a relatively simple procedure that the dogs seem to tolerate fairly well, and the other is something which they f themselves find intolerable to watch their dogs suffering. Um, just back to Claudia Beams' question, really, um, in terms of the numbers needed to treat from diesel through to R2 papers, I think it none of the figures are unsurprising to me it simply reflects and if we accept the fact that the highest risk dogs are those that are in work the diesel paper was all dogs seen at veterinary practices so that wasn't even just working breed dogs that was all dogs so no wonder the prevalence in that population is going to be much lower of tail injury and the lower the prevalence and the higher the number needed to treat they're inversely correlated um, in the veterinary practice survey data where we ended up with high numbers needed to treat again that's working dog breeds, not just working dogs. In the owner-reported survey, that's working dogs, and I accept, again, that is owner-reported injuries, which is going to be much more prevalent than re injuries that go on uh, to be seen by a vet. So it's simply a, a reflection of the prevalence of the clear injury that is defined in the different studies in the populations in those three different studies. Thank you. 
Mark Troskell. Do you want to come? I just drill that down a bit more, though, into you, uh, amputations, which we discussed earlier on. I mean, uh, the panel hasn't been able to provide figures for how many hunt point retrievers and spaniels there are in Scotland. But, you know, let, let's say there are 20,000 hunt point retrievers. Based on the figures that are provided in the Cameron study, if every single one of those dogs had had its tail amputated as a puppy and therefore no longer had a tail anymore, that would mean that 48 adult dogs would no longer require amputation in their adult lives as, as a working dog. Now, in terms of the trade-off there between what I acknowledge is a painful and debilitating operation for an adult dog and an operation on a young puppy under five days old, is that an acceptable trade-off? You know, 20,000, the entire population of working dogs of these two breeds in Scotland being amputated versus 48 adults. I mean, those are the, those are the figures when we expand them out. And you could, you could add on, you know, 30,000, 40,000 or 10,000 onto that. We, 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 we don't understand the size amputation of amputation of 20,000 dog steals. We're talking about shortening a 20,000 dog steals as opposed to full amputation, uh, just to be clear on the use of the language. What, uh, my understanding, convener, is there isn't much of a difference in veterinary medical terms between taking a third of a tail off and taking an entire well, let's tail get, off. Well, let's get that explained. That, that would be yeah. useful. I mean, firstly, are they equivalent? Is amputation equivalent? Um, and secondly, in terms of that trade-off, you know, 48 versus 20,000, if you say so the population of Spaniels is 20,000. I don't think, I th I don't think uh, uh, tail shortening of a five-day-old puppy is remotely equivalent to tail docking an adult dog. Uh, we've just described two entirely different procedures. Um, I think could, there's... Could you explain why that is physiologically? Uh, physiologically, we don't think, uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just remind you I'm a general practitioner. Physiologically, um, I don't think the bone structure is not the same. Uh, the vascular structure is almost certainly not the same, but developing. The nerve structure is not the same, but developing. Okay? I think... Uh, and I think that's where, that's where we're, that's that's our starting point, okay. You, the, the numbers you're, the numbers you're trying to put in there. I'm looking at one litter of cocker spaniels, uh, a, a litter of three, two of whom are now tail docked as adults because of tail damage, and I think we will both see many of us in general practice perhaps dealing with a similar population to what I'm dealing with, or dealing with, maybe dealing with similar occasions when um, pups have not been tail docked. It, it, does not, it does not tie in with the number that we, we got from research, but it's what I'm finding in general practice. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, going back to your point about tail amputation, I think tail shortening, tail docking and tail amputation are the same, in my view, the same thing. We're actually taking away a section of the dog's tail um, and by further clarification, tail shortening will be um, perhaps taking less of that away, but you're still amputating a section of that dog's tail. Um, when it comes to the pain associated with it, um, I think that or, or the sort of development of the the neonate and the, the pain that they may experience. Um, David Morton did a review of the two papers in the vet record, and actually I don't know his um, background to this or where he, he has qualified this statement, um, but he has looked at, or he has stated that, in fact, it has been shown for many species that neonatal animals feel more pain than adults. Um, and I think it's important that we still um, think of amputation or tail docking in that way. E. Morton also wrote a paper 25 years ago and said if 80% of working dogs of a particular sporting breed were likely to require therapeutic intervention at a later date, then it may be possible to make a case for prophylactic docking. But low percentage cases that actually need vet treatment, it would be hard to justify. 
and the total amount of suffering caused by prophylactic docking of puppies is likely to be greater than the few requiring therapeutic surgery later on where appropriate anaesthetics and pain relief are available and there is long-term pain relief available to give to dogs for the few weeks before and after surgery if required. And one final point, any pain caused by therapeutic surgery can be justified by being entirely in the interest of that animal. Not the pain prior to surgery. Sorry. Sorry, could you go... Through well, the chair. Yeah, oh, sorry. I, sorry, I'm sorry. a bit confused as to who's speaking. Uh, sorry, um, Jim Dukes, come in on that point. Yeah, I mean, it, it just comes round and round to the same point, effectively, as to um, what is the percentage, what is the benefit, and that's really what you're trying to draw down onto, isn't it? I mean, your figure of 48 is presumably based on, I don't know what, the practices that I've spoken to, um, on average, currently uh, docking two to three dogs per year. The small mixed practice would be perhaps one to two vet full-time equivalent that I spoke to. Um, now, that isn't a lot, but you translate it across Scotland, that's probably actually hundreds rather than the tens or whatever that you're speaking about. Um, and as I say, there may be an over -represent, You know, you're not looking, again, because a lot of people who have working dogs bring in dogs from the rest of the UK um, and elsewhere, that you may not actually be the percentage of working dogs that are undocked and therefore liable to injury may be much higher um, than you're su suggesting. I mean, with, with due respect, I'm basing my figures on the data that's been produced in the studies that are being used to back up this change in the law in Scotland. So I'm really trying to drill down into some certainty here, and I'm really <laughs> extrapolating that population out to 20,000 because I've heard absolutely no evidence this morning as to what the total population of these two breeds are in Scotland. So I've, right now, I think it's very difficult for this committee to understand what the benefits and risks are of this introduction. To which end are the committee has to try and get that information in the, the next week. Uh, and, and if any, anyone on the panel subsequently has access to that information, we'd be happy for you to write to the committee and share that. Tim Parkin. While the rest of the panel members have been um, talking away, I've been doing some maths. And if you look at the letter of paper, and if you look at the uh, of those respondents, a th approximately a thousand respondents, and if we take the estimate that are approximately seventeen thousand members of the shooting fraternity could have responded, and if we so if we look at the pr number of spaniels amongst those thousand and multiply that up by seventeen, and there were. Uh, 1,330 spaniels amongst the 1,000 respondents, then you're going to be in the region of about 23 spaniels in Scotland. And if you look at HBRs, it's going to be in the region of 3,500 hunt-point retrievers in Scotland. So I'm always very wary of extrapolating up from a relatively small sample, but that might give us an idea of the ballpark figure of those particular breeds in Scotland. Okay, have we exhausted this particular theme? Is uh, Finlay Carson, sorry. I'd like to ask, about, is it reasonable to suggest that the number of dogs being presented uh, with tail injuries can be dramatically influenced by the number of dogs that we import from south of the border that have already been tail docked? Uh, I suppose it's a, it's just a question to the, the Dog Trust. I, I presume you lobby south of the border for a ban on tail docking. Would you accept that that may have an effect of increasing the number of adult dogs being presented with tail injuries in Scotland after that, say, say that was to take place? And, and, and the figures we're actually seeing just now are, are not necessarily uh, accurate because we don't know how many dogs have been imported with their tails already docked. Um, I think, trying to understand the question, I think um, one of the things that you are mentioning is that we actually don't know the figure of dogs that we have in Scotland that are working at this point and I think that's something that I am unable to answer for you today. Um, I'm not sure I'd be able to find that figure out for you either. And then the cross-border action, I'm not sure if anybody can evaluate that fully either um, because it's a very difficult um, market or um, route to try and look at I think. Um, so I'm afraid I probably can't answer that question totally for you today. I suppose I'm coming from, the, you know, we've heard from the panel that it appears to be a very low number of dogs being presented in later life with tail injuries based on the number of hunting uh, dogs that there are. But that might be 
quite dramatically affected by the number of already docked dogs we have. So if we were to, if we were to stop docking across the, the whole of the United Kingdom, we might see these figures in Scotland rise dramatically. Um, and absolutely, we're active in... in um trying to make sure that docking of dog's tails is made illegal. Um, and we're very pleased that Scotland has taken that stance up until now. Um, they've really led the, the sort of welfare aspect of, of this particular point. I'm not Tim Parker in a second, but the, but the other influencing factor here that we cannot quantify is the number of dog's tails, in, dog tail injuries that are dealt with by their owners. So to get the full picture, you would really need to have that information, difficult though it is to ascertain. Tim Parkin. Um, going back to that, that issue, um, one of the questions we did ask in the questionnaire was um, where the dog was bred and whether that was pre or post the introduction of the 2007 legislation. And uh, pre the legislation, approximately 80% of spaniels in, owned by those respondents were bred in Scotland post the legislation, it went down to 51.5%. So that gives you an indication of the cross-border traffic, if you like, uh, that has been the result of the introduction of the legislation. Okay, well, let's move this on, uh, Peter Chapman. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I just went to explore the, the types of <coughs> dogs that we can possibly tail dock. And it says in the regulations that of the type known as Spaniel, of any breed or combination of breeds, or of the type known as hunt, point, retrieve of any breed or combination of breed. Now that seems fairly, fairly vague. So are you content with the breeds and combination of breeds covered by the regulations? Um, I think it's. I think it's got a huge. Um, there, there's a. There's an element in that that could um, provide a huge loophole when you're looking at combinations of the breeds. Um, and I think also trying to identify um, those breed types. Um, when we look at the Welsh regulations where they've tried to list the breed types, they're incomplete um, on the hunt point retriever side and there will always be changes in perhaps the types of dogs that are being worked in the UK with a wider market looking across Europe and, and in other countries. So I think I would have concerns over um, the legislation um, trying to state that I mean so so are you saying that we should we should try and, and you know you're, you're saying we don't need to state the, the breeds no I'm, I'm I'm not up for this ex exemption at all I'm I'm very much thinking we really need to reject it no, no, but I mean, what I'm trying to say is that other areas of the country that have tried to look at this um, have not maybe captured the full list of breeds that would be um, related to the hunt point retriever breeds um, and also we have um, an issue where the crosses which could then make it a very broad sweep of what types of dogs might be presented for mm. tail docking it doesn't actually help to tighten that up no, I, mean, I know you don't want it but if, if, if we do agree to do go down this road do we do you believe we should have a tighter list of uh, an absolute list of breeds that, that, that can be docked It's difficult to answer that only because we're still we're so we're firmly opposed to this as a as a an exemption at all. Um, however, I appreciate that the research that's gone ahead and the um, focus of that was trying to identify the fewest dogs that would be affected. Um, so I appreciate from a scientific background that's really what the the remit was um, from the Scottish perspective and with Tim. Um, but I think we, we are in an age where we have so many different new breeds or new types of dogs coming forwards. And coming from um, Dogs Trust, we know that very much in other spheres, um, that I think it's going to be very difficult to pinpoint exactly the type of dog that might be presented for a working breed. Okay, anybody else? I think, got a comment? Uh, I, 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 think, uh, you've got, I think you've got it fairly tight here. I think the, the hunt point retriever breeds are fairly well defined in this country. I think the spaniel or any breed or combination of breeds, I think, uh, again, from my area, would basically be primarily cocker spaniel, springer spaniel, and probably springer, cro springer cocker cross. Okay, I think you've also got the... Uh, the evidence to be presented to the vet, well, as soon as we're into that, 
we're talking about a vet that hopefully already knows what what the game what the what the um the legislation is all about so that in itself is going to make a vast difference so we're already going to be ahead of the game and knowing that this dog is is not for working or this dog is highly unlikely to be for working uh, i refuse to do this procedure um we've gone away from the point in addition the fact that we have already um uh, stopped tail docking in, in in all breeds in this country we've talked about yorkshire terriers uh, we used to do Yorkshire Terriers, we used to do Boxers, we talked about Rottweilers. Um, we have stopped all of these other procedures. We are trying, it, certainly in the, in the shooting field, to try and narrow this very, down as close as we can to a narrow group of dogs. And, and I accept that we are trying to narrow it. I think this is a very narrow group of dogs that we are aiming to tail dock. Um, I, I, just, just to point out, my own reading of it was the combination of breeds was a combination of breeds within breed types and so not expanding it to all other cross breeds and that sort of thing. For If you have a Weimarana cross with X, Y or Z, it's a co combination of breeds within the breed type. So that kind of keeps it tight nice. as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Kate Forbes. <clears throat> Thank you. This is a question to sort of round up, so if there's anything else that you'd like to add in your answers, feel free to. But in recognition that um, there are some uh, dogs who suffer, working dogs who suffer um, tail injuries in later life, do you think that the regulations are a proportionate response to this issue and what changes would you make to the regulations as a whole? We've already touched on breeds, but would you make any other changes to the regulations? Um, in recognition that there are problems later on in life for working dogs. And if we just go through the panel, and I'll give you an opportunity to make any concluding statements. We start um, with Jim Jukes. Um, I think, in principle, no, I think it's, it's for the people that are affected by this and the dogs that are affected by this, I think this legislation is really, really important. And it's going to change a lot of people and a lot of working dogs' lives if the amendments are made as suggested. Um, I think it's important that it's um, it's clear and it's straightforward, and I believe it it, it is, um, and I think it needs to be robust in force. And yeah, in principle, I would be happy to, to see the change. Yeah, um, I would. A couple of points. I still think there's only a tiny percentage that actually need treating, so I think it's a disproportionate response. Um, I feel that there's more can be done with prevention. We've not heard anything about breeding for tail carriage or anything like that and we've had 10 years um, to, to work on that but you haven't heard anything that people have actually been trying to breed from dogs who've not had tail injuries um, or an innovation to design a guard or sheath they basically want to do this and one final thing our oath is to protect the welfare of animals in our care to not inflict unnecessary suffering and we are the animals advocate Prevention of damage later on in life as a direct result of human use of these animals is questionable. Um, from Dog Trust's perspective, um, we would reject the review of these regulations based on a lot of the arguments that we've made today. Um, the regulations that have been put forwards are very brief when you look at other documents in this in this field in other parts of the country. Um, I don't feel that, or we don't feel that it gives um, enough narrowing, um, but actually it's based on research which we feel doesn't stand up to um, the concerns around the welfare and the pain of this procedure for puppies to undergo. It is a surgical procedure and it's done at a point where we cannot help and manage pain around it. Um, so we have huge, huge reservations for that. Um, and we've already mentioned about the, the breed um, perspective as well. Um, I think looking at the calculations, far more um, dogs or animals would need to be docked than are injured, and I think it is disproportionate in um, in light of the evidence that we've seen. I think the the, the draft legislation uh, reads well. I think we would need to we may need to uh, be more comfortable as to uh, what evidence is shown 
Um, but I, th I think I think the draft legislation actually reads reads quite sensibly. I think we have to remember we are categorically not talking about aesthetics here. We are talking about, uh, and we've got four vets each arguing welfare from a slightly different perspective. My version of welfare is very much I would be uh, tail shortening uh, the young pups uh, rather than watching an adult dog i'm sorry it suffers chronic pain we know we've got we have we have some fant fantastic medicines there's no doubt about that but these dogs are invariably suffering some level of chronic pain uh, up until and even after tail docking if that's what we have to do as adults i think it's also worthwhile uh, let's remain, remember that gun dogs are essential for um and central for shooting or retrieving or deer stalking. Uh, the gun dogs are actually an essential part of that whole process from a welfare point of view of what we may be hunting. Okay. Thank you. Dr Parkin, do you want to...? Just, just a summing up, really. Um, given the limitations of the, the work that was commissioned by the Scottish Government, <coughs> I still strongly believe that the two papers provide the best available evidence on which to base um, evidence-based policy change. Um, I don't think that we could design studies that would improve the evidence in any way. We did have a third aspect of this work that was trying to follow a cohort of individual animals through, individual dogs through, that was simply impossible to implement, um, which we didn't take any further. I think this evidence uh, here stands up to reasonable scrutiny. We recognise the biases and the limitations within the work, but I do think it provides the best available evidence to potentially introduce legislation that, in my view, is an improvement on that which stands south of the border. OK. OK. Can I thank all of the witnesses for their evidence today? That's been a useful session for the members. Um, again, as we touched upon earlier, if you come across in the next week or so any studies that are relevant to some of the lines of questioning today, please do feel free to send them on to the clerks. At its next meeting on the 6th of June, the committee will take evidence from stakeholders on the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill and will consider the Loch Carran uh, Urgent Marine Conservation Order 2017 SSI 2017-158. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.